this the hard way, so I hope that this can be helpful to you. And I wasn't making as much money as I would have liked. Economic nexus, and I would just be like, how much stock should I buy? Like, I cry. There are tears. <laughs> it is suffering. Hello, hello, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Megan. I'm an illustrator and I have run my online art store for over three years now, which I think is kind of wild. This is kind of going to be the third episode in my How to Sell Your Art Online series. So I filmed two videos previously to this. The first one is kind of old. I filmed it like when I first started my YouTube channel. Um, the information in it is slightly outdated, but still I think is a really useful video. I talk a lot about how to sell handmade goods, how to sell your art when you don't have a lot of followers. The second video I filmed about a year and a half-ish later. That one I talk a lot about my journey to becoming fully self-employed. Also how to grow your art account, social media. I feel like I've learned a lot since I filmed the last one, specifically manufacturing manufacturing, how to find manufacturers, taxes, sales tax, business tax, income tax, just like how to go about that as an artist. I made a YouTube community post and a lot of you asked quite really good questions about social media. So I will also be addressing that at the end. The video will be sectioned. So if you go to like the little play bar and you hover, the video will be broken down into different sections. Really just feel free to hop to wherever you want in the video. Don't feel like you have to listen to the whole thing if you don't want to. I also have it all time stamped below in the description box. Enough intro. <laughs> we have have a lot of ground to cover so let's just jump into it. I also have all my notes on my little laptop here so if you see me looking down a lot that's why. Section one is all about manufacturing. Before we sell anything we need to have the items that we want to sell. I used to sell a lot of handmade stuff. My shop primarily was like just handmade goods so I would make like clay pins, clay earrings. Over time I found that it really wore down on my body like my I started to get tendonitis and I also found that I would kind of hit a bit of a profit ceiling. There was only so much time I could dedicate to producing these items and I wasn't making as much money as I would have liked. So eventually I started transitioning my shop to only manufacture goods. So I would invest the time up front in making the print, the sticker, whatever. And then I would be able to order like a larger quantity and just keep selling them. So like every unit I had, I didn't have to like give time to making it. Oftentimes it is more expensive to manufacture goods. It couldn't be a little bit riskier financially, but I found for me the payoff was worth it. So yeah, that's why I manufacture stuff. It's just easier to scale your business. I know a lot of people who have really successful handmade businesses, but personally, this is just what has worked the best for me. What should you manufacture? Obviously this is a person to person thing. Make whatever you wanna make. I started out with prints and stickers. I feel like that's really the bread and butter of an artist's shop. A lot of times when you produce a piece of art and someone likes it, they will ask you be like, oh, do you have a print of this? Can I get a sticker of that? And they're also really easy to produce. There are a bunch of different manufacturers you can go to to make them. For stickers, I love Sticker Ninja. I used to use Sticker App. They're also great. Um, but recently I have transitioned to being a loyal Sticker Ninja customer because I love how I can print my files in RGB. They just come out so bright. I find the stickers to be really high quality. And for prints, I've always used cat print. When you're first starting out, I do recommend starting with prints and stickers just because they're really easy to make, a lot cheaper to produce and some of the other manufactured items. So other items you can sell if you wanna diversify your stock. I think stationary items are a really good place to branch out next. Washi tape, keychains, memo pads are a big one as well. After that, I expanded into more apparel, like screen printing on different kinds of products, t-shirts, tote bags, canvas pouches. That's another way you can go. And most recently, I have expanded even further into more complicated products to design and manufacture, like socks and plushies. So there's a lot of options out there if you want to have like a manufactured goods art shop but i would definitely start with prints and stickers and you can slowly expand into other things the more uh, you start turning a profit it'll be easier to obviously make the down payment to like invest in more inventory i think one of my biggest pieces of advice i say in all of these videos is to just start small I think running an art store can be so intimidating because on social media, we see people with like huge businesses. You see people hacking all these orders. You can start out with just making handmade items, make one item, sell, try to sell that one item. Everyone starts from somewhere. So yeah, start small and then grow. Now the question everyone wants to know is how do I find the manufacturers? So if it's something you're printing, like stickers, prints, if you're printing onto a t-shirt, you're printing onto a tote bag, those manufacturers are a lot easier to source. Um, there's a bunch of businesses you can just quickly Google. And in terms of like screen printing on garments and apparel and bags and stuff, what I like to do is just Google like screen printer and then type in like where I'm located. And oftentimes it's pretty easy to find local screen printers or at least like screen printers in your country. There's so many of them across the state. I find that when I go with like 
smaller, small business um, screen printers, I have a much better experience because I get to email like a real person um, and check in like, oh, will my design be like centered? Can it be this big? And you kind of get that back and forth relationship. More complicated things like washi tapes, keychains, fleshies, socks, uh, even like vinyl toys. I, that's really complicated. I haven't gone into vinyl toys territory, but like all of those things, I would recommend you source a manufacturer um, on Alibaba. If you didn't know, Alibaba is like kind of a marketplace website and an app you can go on to source manufacturers. Most of them are based in China. A lot of the factories and companies based in China are just like the experts on making these kinds of products. It's gonna be the most affordable for your business. And that is where like the majority of those products come from. If you see artists selling those products, like they're, mo they're most likely made in companies in China. I highly recommend going on Alibaba. You can download the app, make an account, um, just search up like washi tape manufacturer and just like scroll. I would look for ones that have good ratings, read the reviews. Don't be afraid of Alibaba. I feel like it took me a really long time to kind of go that route. I guess the, the marketplace was just really intimidating. Their messaging, I love their messaging app. It's so convenient to just like message back and forth rather than an email. You can send files over messenger. They can take payments through their messaging platform too. Use your judgment. If something seems a bit sketchy, don't go with them. But there's tons of reputable businesses on there. I also will say I have had a bit of an unfortunate experience with one manufacturer when I made my socks a few months ago um, I ordered a bunch of socks they came out beautiful but then I realized they had stitching problems so if you're making something a bit more complicated like a sock or a plushie or something I highly recommend getting a sample first it is more expensive to have them make the sample and ship it to you I would say it's worth it because what happened to me is I sold all of those socks and I kind of had to recall them so don't be like me and get a sample <laughs> that being said that manufacturer that I worked with were really nice and they replaced it like immediately so yeah don't be too scared of Alibaba if you want to make those kinds of products try to reach out to multiple manufacturers before you go with one often times like they all have different pricing so you'll reach out to a manufacturer be like hello i want to make a hundred of this sock design can you give me a quote so just ask around for different quotes another way to i guess source manufacturers is also to just if you have art friends who also have a shop you can ask them where they've made it. I will say some people don't like sharing their manufacturers. You know, it's nothing personal. Um, I totally get it. I like to share manufacturers with my mutuals, but um, a lot of people don't and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's, it's, it takes a lot of time and energy to find a good manufacturer. You're spending so much money. Like if you try a product and you don't like it, that's kind of just like wasted money. So if someone doesn't want to share, please don't take it personally. It's, it's just a thing. Continue, I would like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is the all on the platform you can use to build your business. I use it as a portfolio website. I love that you can password protect certain pages. So I have my Patreon shop up there as well. I have my links page there too. So when people want to know like where to find my YouTube channel, where to find my Patreon, where to find my shop, it's all there on my Squarespace site. I love that they have mobile view. I found out recently that like 80% of people who go on my website are using their phones. So being able to edit my website with mobile view is just so, so useful. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Megan Wang for 10% off your first purchase. Another quick tip is to ask for proofs or samples before they start production. I don't always do this for prints and stickers with companies I worked with a lot, like I kind of know what I'm gonna get. But if I'm trying something new like a sock, sample, plushie, definitely get a sample. If I'm putting on a t-shirt, I like to see like kind of a digital proof to sort of know what it's gonna look like. Going for this route will give you a lot of assurance um, to know the product is gonna come how you want it to because there's nothing worse than spending a bunch of money, being really excited for your product to arrive and then you open it and you're like, what is this? <laughs> Another quick tip is to learn a little bit about color profiles. I don't have the most amazing understanding of, of color profiles, but basically when things are printed, they are printed in different kinds of color profiles. So on your screen, um, oftentimes it is an RGB. So the colors are super vibrant, but those kind of like juicy, vibrant colors you can see on your screen can't always be printed into something physical. Um, and oftentimes, manufacturers will print in CMYK. The colors are significantly more dull. So if you are making something on your iPad, you wanna make sure to um, convert 
that piece of art into CMYK before you send it off to your printer. And if you're working with a manufacturer, I would always ask, sometimes they have it on their website, um, to know what kind of files they support and what color profiles they want it in. This will also save you so much trouble in the future. When I first started making stickers, I remember like getting them and I was like, why are the colors so ugly? And it was because I had drawn the thing in RGB and it was printed in CMYK. Also another quick tip is sometimes you can save money by doing like more manual tasks yourself. For example, um, if you make enamel pins and you wanna have backing cards, print the backing cards yourself with another printer and then kind of assemble them all one by one. I've seen a lot of artists do that. I've done that a few times um, and that can kind of save you a little bit of money. So if you're in more of like a cost saving mindset, you can try to look at the product you wanna produce and see like, okay, is there a way I can sort of do some of the labor on my own? Another thing that people ask me all the time when I make these kinds of videos is how much stock should I buy? Like, how do I know what to buy first? How much of each item should I buy? Like how much would, is a good profit? And these are all really tough questions to answer because it's really like a case by case basis. For me, when I buy stock, I, it's always kind of hard. Even to this day, after three years of running my shop, I will still get that number wrong. It's so hard to anticipate demand. For example, I ordered a hundred pairs of each sock. They did amazing. They sold out in a couple hours. So in that situation, I probably should have bought more, but you know, I bought like a hundred zines last year and I'm still selling them. It's been a couple months. So it's really hard to know what people will like and how much of something to order. If you're just starting out and you don't have a lot of followers, you don't really know how much people are gonna be interested in your product, I would just be more careful. I would probably buy around like 30 stickers. 30 prints, I would keep the numbers super low because you can always order more. Start small, start with really small numbers, grow from there, and the more you do your shop, the more you will kind of know how much stock to order. All right, we are now at this very, very scary section, which is taxes. I've noticed in a lot of these like small business art videos, most people don't talk about taxes very much. I haven't talked about it until now because taxes terrify me and I really just didn't want to give anybody inaccurate information, but I do feel like I have learned enough about it. I would have killed for someone to tell me this stuff a few years ago, even a few months ago, because every time I would like go on YouTube and Google something about taxes, it would always be more of like a business oriented video where they would use a bunch of vocabulary I didn't understand. They would talk about like economic nexus and I would just be like, <sighs> this is gonna be like me explaining it to you in my artist girl terms. Also, I have to say this, I am just a random girl on the internet you found. I am not an accountant, I am not a professional, and this is not financial advice. And take everything I say with a grain of salt. All of this info could be wrong. This is just my understanding of some of these topics. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. <laughs> I had to learn all this the hard way, so I hope that this can be helpful to you. The first piece of advice I want everyone to really internalize is to get an accountant. It's obviously more expensive to pay someone to prepare your taxes for you, but I have not regretted any cents I have given an accountant before just because doing it yourself is painful. I cry, there are tears, <laughs> it is suffering. You can also deduct that expense of like having someone prepare your taxes for next year's tax return. Obviously, if you can't afford it, softwares like TurboTax are obviously fine, but I would recommend getting an accountant. You can also ask them little questions. I love to like ask my accountant some questions. Um, I'd love to say like, oh, is there anything you would recommend me to do next year to make this easier? Is there anywhere you're seeing like that I could help with saving some money on my tax bill? Also for quarterly taxes, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit, your accountant will give you like a breakdown of how much to pay quarterly. Just super helpful. I personally go with the company called Brass Taxes, which I would recommend. If you use my name when you file, you can get $25 off and I get a little bit of money as well. So if you wanna help me out. So first let's talk about sales tax. I used to be terrified of sales tax, but it's actually not that scary. So depending on where you live, you will probably need to get some kind of license or permit to collect and remit the sales tax. I collect sales tax for people who li are living in my area. So when I was in California, when someone who lived in California would buy from me, sales tax platform on my website would automatically collect the sales tax for me. You need to just go onto your government website, your local government website for whatever city you live in. Um, when I was in California, I would have to get um, a sales tax permit. And then during certain periods of the year, I think it's four times a year, I would have to log on to like the California 
tax website. I don't know what it's called. It's like CDTFA or something. I would just like put in the profits I got from people who lived in California and then I would pay that money that I had in my account. Certain websites will collect and remit that for you. Um, but honestly, it's not that bad. I used to be really scared of it, but it's not that scary once you do it once. In terms of business licenses, you most likely have to go get a business license. Um, not everyone does. I'm not saying, you know, the, the feds are gonna be knocking on your door because you sold one pair of earrings on Etsy without a business license. But if you wanna make a, a business out of this, you wanna do this really regularly, you're seeing a lot of a profit, I would go get a business license. Obviously, I'm not sure what the policy is in every state, but every state I have lived in requires that. Um, when I was in California, it was really simple to get a license. I just went onto like my city's business website um, and it was really fast to get my license and permit. It does cost some money, but it, if you wanna do everything legally and by the books, get a business license. Next, we're gonna talk about something a bit more painful, which is income tax. <laughs> when I first started my business, I really wasn't making a lot of money. I feel like I might have been making like less than $20,000 a year, which is not enough to live off of. But because I am turning a lot larger of a profit now, I have to pay a lot in income tax. All the money you make, you have to pay taxes on. When you work for someone else, for an employer, they are taking money out of your paycheck for you. So when you file your taxes at the end of the year, you, you might have to pay something, but it won't be like a huge sum of money. But when you work for yourself, no one's taking that money out. And you have to pay a self-employment tax on top of that. So also certain states collect state income tax as well. So you don't just have to pay income tax to the federal government. You also might have to pay income taxes to your state government too. But luckily, because we are business owners, we can do business expenses. So business expenses can lower your taxable income. So if I make a hundred bucks and I spent $20 on supplies, my taxable income would become $80. Obviously taxing $80 a certain percentage versus $100 a certain percentage, you're gonna be paying less if you account for your business expenses. This is why it is super, super, super important to keep a spreadsheet. I have one spreadsheet where I have everything broken down by different kinds of categories that I care about. Um, like I wanna know how much I spent on inventory. I wanna know how much I spent on like tech supplies, art supplies. And that spreadsheet is like kind of for my own records. And then I have a separate spreadsheet that is like really for tax purposes. Brass Taxes actually gives it out and I've edited it a lot to my own preferences. Basically when I input all of my business expenses, I can categorize them by the same categories that are on your tax return. No matter how you do it, it doesn't have to be super complicated like I do it. Just please make sure to record every expense you make for your business. There's also certain things that you don't think are business expenses, which are, if you get an art book, um, deduct that because that is for research. You're using it to look and inspire yourself to make more materials. Um, if you drive a car, you can deduct gas sometimes too. If you work from home and you have a home office, if it has a door, you can deduct your home office as well. Your phone bill, your internet, there's a lot that you can deduct that people don't think about. Make your life easier, keep up with it regularly. It's painful in the moment, but doing it monthly will be way better than doing it yearly. Another huge tip I have is to pay your taxes quarterly. You heard me quarterly. <laughs> I've only done this recently and it's been so helpful. Basically, you're just paying your income tax in every quarter. So at the end of the year, your bill isn't super high because you've been breaking it up. It makes it much less painful. Also, a cute thing that I didn't know is that technically we are supposed to be paying quarterly. My first year that I didn't, I think they like waived some sort of fine, but last year I got fined because I did not pay quarterly. Um, and the fine was like around a hundred bucks, which is like, that's money, you know? So paying quarterly is not that scary. Like I said, um, your accountant will give you kind of like a breakdown of how much money you should be paying quarterly. I think there's several ways to pay quarterly. It's really not that scary. I think you go to like irs.gov. Um, and then you just like click a bunch of links, you can make an account, there's ways to do it. The other way I know of to sort of lower your tax bill is to invest money. Personally, I have a SEP IRA, which is for self-employed people. By putting money into that IRA, that lowers my taxable income too. So there is a podcast with someone called, I think they're called Money with Katie that I listen to. Um, and I found super useful, so I will link it below. She talks a lot about like how to lower your taxable income if you're a self-employed person. So that's something I started doing this year. I've been putting some money into my SEPAR IRA and that lowers 
my taxable income and also like it's still my money instead of like when you make a business expense like you're obviously letting that money go but for investing like you're still keeping that money it's just now in investments so this is where things are gonna get a little complicated so another thing I hear about a lot, and this is something I also wondered so much when I first started out, do I need an LLC? I'm sure you hear it all the time. A lot of artists out there with small businesses are LLCs. Look into it. Another good perk, like I said, of getting an accountant, this is the perfect question to ask them. You can say like, hey, do you think an LLC is right for me? Um, that's what I did and that guy I talked to said no. <laughs> if you are just starting out, you are technically a sole proprietor. Um, this just means that like when you file your taxes, you only file one return, like you are the business. A lot of artists and freelancers out there are sole proprietors. It's honestly the easiest way to go because like there's no extra paperwork, but a lot of people will go become LLCs because there is a little bit of legal protection. This basically kind of separates you from your business. So like if you get sued, um, things like bankruptcy happen, like it's not you, it's like the business. So there is a bit of protection there. But I think there is a bit of a misconception that like once you declare yourself to be an LLC, boom, you will have tax savings. That's not really the case. Becoming an LLC does give you more flexibility um, to decide how you want to be taxed. I went on to nerdwallet.com and I'm gonna read some of this stuff for you. A key difference between LLCs versus sole proprietorships is tax flexibility. Only LLC owners can decide how they want their business to be taxed. They can either stick with the default pass-through taxation, which is like, I think similar to how you would be taxed as a sole proprietor, or they can elect the LLC to be taxed as an S corporation or a C corporation. So when you're taxed as a corporation, an S corporation, um, it can give you some tax savings because basically you have, you put yourself on payroll. There is more paperwork. Um, setting it up, there are fees, I'm pretty sure. And a lot of people don't recommend it until you really start turning like kind of a higher profit. When I first started out and I talked to my accountant about this, he was like, I would only start looking into it when you're making around 100,000 or plus. And because of the fees and all the time it takes, it starts to become more worth it at a certain point. So if you're just starting out, I'm, this is probably so irrelevant to you, but if you are starting to turn a bit of a profit and you're like, why is my tax bill so high? Some things to look into, business expenses, really make a point to record everything. Second, look into an IRA. Some IRAs are deductible, some aren't. This is only for certain people. Like if you're really turning a really high profit, look into an escort. And of course, the overarching theme in this section is get an accountant. Um, oftentimes, even when you're not filing your taxes, an accountant, you can do a consultation. This is something I did with brass taxes. I paid around a hundred plus dollars, but I sat down with like a really smart accountant man for an hour and he helped me out a lot. If you have the funds, hiring someone to tell you, you know, how to go about these things for your specific situation could be worth it. And I'm going to leave a bunch of links in the description box about like finance podcasts that I've listened to, mostly run by women. <laughs> about listening to men talk about like finances I'm just like and for the last section of this video we're gonna be talking a lot about social media social media marketing how to attract the followers YouTube I got a lot of questions from you guys on YouTube the first question is from Carrie's who asked I'm wondering how creating merchandise and selling your works has impacted your art focus and motivations and tips to not let your business mindset hinder your creative practices Hope all is well, Megan, and welcome back to the East Coast. Thank you very much. Um, this is a great question and something I struggle with constantly. <laughs> I find that when I make merch for too long, I my brain, my art creative brain just starts to focus only on like, what will people like and what will sell? And I find that that is like terrible for my artistic growth and just, just like my artwork in general. Social media is so, intertwined with my art business and my art practice. It's the reason that I'm able to make a living off of my work is because of social media. So it's really hard to disentangle those two things and just like make whatever I want. Because it's a business, I do have to cater to what I think the general public will like. Really the best I can do is just try to do a balance. This is why I like to have four shop updates every year. I used to do them monthly, which was terrible for me, but thanks to my patrons who, I haven't given a shout out yet. I love my patrons. Uh, my patrons allow me to take longer breaks between my shop updates. So I'm able to have like some periods where I'm not designing merch 
and that can help me like kind of get out of that shop mindset and work on other stuff that like I am really curious about, give me some time to like not be in that shop space. Madison Sarah asked, I'd love to know more about how you factor in time for social media. Recording, editing, and posting can take so much out of me sometimes. I'd love to know how that process goes for you. Also, maybe how you approach choosing what and what not to share, thanks. Posting and just like managing a social media account is so tiring. I like to plan ahead. So if I know I want to like post a reel or something, I'll be like, okay, Tuesday, we're posting a reel. We're gonna make art post a reel. I'll purposely not give myself anything else to do that day or I will lessen my workload because I know it's going to be like very energy sucking for me to do that. And for like YouTube videos, for example, I will take times between filming. So like one week I'll film, the next week I won't. I and mean, kind of staggering it really helps. So I just like have more energy. I find if I just like film constantly, um, I really start to burn out, so. And in terms of what I choose to share, uh, sometimes it's kind of a gut feeling. I don't always love filming my process. Um, I think this is just because like, I really get in the zone, so I don't really want to pull out the camera, so I will just allow myself to keep going. Um, and then maybe I'll show the camera like the final product. The next question is, can you please give advice for someone who wants to start a channel on YouTube, like tips for editing cameras or if, if an iPhone is enough? I would really love to share my art on YouTube, but I feel kind of nervous and shy. Love your channel, by the way. Thank you so much. I talk about this all the time on my Patreon, so I apologize for all my patrons who have heard me say this like a million times, but my biggest piece of advice for people who want to start a YouTube channel is to just like make your first video. Your first video will be the hardest video you ever have to film because like everything is new. There's also a lot of like fear with it, I think. Um, it is very scary, especially if you're an introvert, especially if you're more shy. So really forcing yourself to make that first video will help tremendously. I found for me after my first video, I was a lot more excited to get back into it. Um, the next thing I say if you're shy is like, you can just film a really quick, simple video. Don't show your face. You don't even have to talk. You can use like little text. Um, while you're editing and just keep it like super easy what you're comfortable with and the more videos you post like the more you can get comfortable with showing your face if you want to do that um, the more you get comfortable with talking in front of the camera if that's what you want to do like that's the kind of videos you want to make because it's just so scary I feel like once you make the first one you get more and more comfortable at least that's how it happened for me like your first video doesn't have to be a masterpiece it doesn't have to be like your magnum opus video and it, it won't be like your first video will probably not be very good because that's just what happens when you first start out doing something unfamiliar you can go back and watch my first video and it'll make you feel probably pretty good <laughs> because my first video is like so bad but it's like really funny and I've kept it up just because like I think it's hilarious like my voice sounds so different I'm so uncomfortable I don't show my face at all I recorded that on my sister's iPhone I didn't even have a tripod so I took a, a pencil cup full of pencils balanced my sister's iPhone in it because she had a better phone than me that had a better camera and I just like wrapped like my clay pin orders in front of the camera um and it's like such a simple video but like once I made that one I was like oh this is actually like fun and the more I got into it. So I think the difference between my first, second, and third videos are just like so drastic. And then in terms of like cameras and stuff, I an iPhone's definitely enough. If you wanna make your first one, use the phone. And then if you find like, okay, I really like doing this and this is something I wanna do more, then you can invest in a camera. For beginners, I would highly recommend the Sony ZV-1 Mark II, that's a Sony point and shoot camera. So you don't really have to know anything about camera settings. You just turn it on and the camera will account for it. The footage is beautiful. Um, and then after you can upgrade, I upgraded to um, a mirrorless camera that I can change the lenses out of. So like, this is how I get like cool effects and like a very nice background, like really sharp footage. I would highly recommend getting a, a tripod though. In the beginning, I didn't want to invest any money in my business or my channel, just cause I think I was really scared. So I would try to like just position the phone in different locations and it would always fall. The angles I got were so weird just cause like I, for some reason I didn't want to pay like 20 bucks to get like a phone tripod. Um, but just 
I would recommend doing that. It'll make your life so much easier. Do you ever feel confined to a certain style or that if you wanna try new things, people won't buy from you? How do you balance creating art that you wanna create with art you think people will want to buy? I personally feel like it's good to have range and be versatile as an artist, but I feel like people are more likely to spend money on someone with a more honed in style. This is something I really struggle with. I struggle with this all the time, just like the perception and like my art being perceived. Will people like this? Will it sell? If it doesn't sell, you know, because my income is so tied with people liking my art, there's just, there is a lot of pressure there. You kind of just have to accept that people aren't gonna like everything. Not everything you make is gonna be a hit. Um, and you kind of have to prioritize artistic growth over um, people liking your art sometimes. Otherwise, a lot of the joy and a lot of the passion that we have for art just like disappears because we're so focused on, you know, pleasing other people. So yeah, sometimes when I make art and I'm like, I really want to make this thing, I'll just make it. And then if I think people won't buy it, I just won't turn it into a product. Like it doesn't need to go from like art to product all the time, accepting that like things might not be a huge hit. Yeah, it's tough being a working artist. I think if you're like a hobbyist artist, who like you don't need to live off your art. There aren't really the same like mental obstacles that you go through because monetizing your art comes with like all of this other stuff. So yeah, there isn't a perfect answer, but you just have to learn how to balance it and whatever works for you. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. If you ran your business without YouTube, what do you think that might look like? I feel like having YouTube vlogs helps a lot with the audience getting to know you, like, and ultimately buy from you. But what about the artists who don't want to dedicate the time to YouTube? Personally, I would just do the same thing I do, just I would market my artwork only on Instagram. And I know a lot of artists who do this who definitely don't need a YouTube channel to have a successful art business. Um, some of my favorite people who have art shops are like Johnny Nitz. Um, he doesn't have a YouTube channel. Jennifer Shao, I love Jennifer Shao's shop. Um, she recently launched a Mango Town, which is like her like rebranded shop. Um, and she doesn't have a YouTube channel as far as I know. Um, Lilliams recently started one. Lily like hasn't made YouTube videos before her most recent studio vlog and she has a super successful business. So all of these artists that I've named and I could, I think I can think of like so many more, they just market themselves on Instagram and other platforms and it works fine. So it's really, really not necessary to have a YouTube channel. Personally, I feel like I would be fine because I think my products can kind of speak for themselves and people engage with me enough on Instagram. How do you deal with the disappointment of not getting projected sales? Um, I'm not the best at this. I definitely do get disappointed when um, I'm really excited about something and doesn't get the sales that I wanted. Um, you really just have to unfortunately like accept it, feel sad for yourself, but try your best to move on. And something that really helps me is I realize like it's all a learning experience. Like if a shop update doesn't go well, I just take notes. I'm like, okay, this product wasn't a hit. Maybe I don't make those next time. Maybe I don't order as much of this next time. How do you grow your following and how do you keep people interested in your content? Again, this is really hard. It, I think algorithms have changed so much within the past few months. Three years ago, I think it was completely different. Um, if I had to start from scratch, I don't, I do not think I would have as many followers as I do now, just because it's so much harder to grow and get noticed. Um, the field is also quite saturated as well. So I think the, the best piece of advice I can give is just persistence is key. Um, not everyone is an overnight success. And honestly, sometimes blowing up overnight isn't always the best because I think there is something to be said about like slowly gaining followers who are very invested in you, who like your work, rather than people who are just there for like one viral TikTok and just like wanted that one thing you made and then they're all gonna leave. I think there is a lot of merit in slowly growing your audience over time of people who are familiar with you as artists and like your body of work rather than just like that one viral moment. Stay as consistent as you can. Keep put out the best work that you're able to. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it to the end, huge shout out. I know this is gonna be a very long video. Please leave me a comment down below if you have any more questions. I might not be able to get to it, but like hopefully this video is seen by other people um, and we can all help each other out in the comments. Yeah. It can be like a little forum where people help each other out. Please subscribe if you made it this far. I feel like if you made it to the very end, like you should probably subscribe. Um, leave me a like, cause I do think that helps. Huge shout out to my patrons for supporting me. They are the reason that I'm able to make these kinds of videos and I'm able to have shop updates. Like this is all possible because of my patrons. Also a lot of this information that I've said in this video has already been discussed over on my Patreon. I have a Patreon podcast. I record it monthly and I address like all of these kinds of questions. So if you're ever curious, you can hop over to my Patreon. 
um, and leave me a question there and I'll definitely get it, get to it in my podcast. Um, and I will see you guys in my next one. Thank you so much for watching and yeah.